All right, Understanding and Obeying the Ten Commandments. This is the uh, title of the uh, small group uh, discussion series that we're doing. We're on lesson number two and the title of this lesson is God First and Only. So let's do a little bit of review of what we've uh, talked about so far. We said that the, uh, the purpose of the Ten Commandments is to expose sin and uh, its consequences. Uh, we read uh, Romans chapter three, verses 19 and 20. Uh, we said also that uh, their relevance uh, to us as Christians is that they, uh, they guide us in the uh, process of eliminating sin from our lives. And we said that this uh, process is called um, uh, sanctification. And so non-Christians need the commandments in order to convict them of sin so that they might find Christ to begin with. And Christians, on the other hand, need the commandments to guide them towards spiritual maturity. All right, so in today's lesson, we're going to start the actual study of the commandments themselves, starting with the first commandment. Uh, the setting of the giving of the commandments. We know that uh, the Jews are in the desert after having uh, left uh, Egypt and God calls both Moses and his brother Aaron to come up the mountain to hear what God has prepared for them. And we read uh, in Exodus uh, chapter 20 verse 1, it says, then God spoke all these words saying, so I want to just stop there. I want you to note that the Bible takes care to say that God himself is speaking, uh, that these commands are not man's inventions or man's ideas. They are a report of what God has spoken directly to man, in this case to, uh, to Moses. So we keep reading verse two, it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And so here God first declares who he is and the power that he has and where it has been demonstrated. Uh, he reveals his name, Jehovah, uh, the self-existent eternal one. Um, we know that the Jews had so much respect for God's name uh, that they didn't pronounce it uh, out loud. The Jews were moved to believe who God said he was. He said he was the Lord, you know, Jehovah, the self-existent uh, self and eternal one, and also the Lord thy God, Elohim, another word for God, meaning the supreme God. And because of what God did to the Egyptian, in other words, he's the Lord, he is God, he's the self-existent one, he's the supreme one. And to the Jews, how did they know he was this? Well, because of what he did to the Egyptians. Uh, he turned a river to uh, blood, he destroyed every firstborn in the land on a given night, except the Jews. Uh, he, uh, he separated the sea for Moses and the people to, uh, to escape uh, the, um, the uh, Egyptian army that was, um, that was uh, chasing them. And so the power that God demonstrated gave him credibility. And his credibility gave him the authority to establish and make laws, as well as demand that they be kept on pain of punishment. So here's the sequence, this is how it works. Uh, you have power, power uh, brings credibility, credibility gives authority, and authority establishes st uh, sovereignty. In this sequence here we see uh, where God is speaking to uh, Moses. So we can continue reading uh, Exodus 20, in verse three it says, you shall have no other gods before me. So based on this premise, the first command demands that people have only him as God. He does not want to be first among many, but rather the only one worshiped as God. That's essentially the first commandment. There is only one God, He is supreme, He is the Lord, He's the eternal one, and because of all of that, only He is God and only He is to be worshiped. Not one among many gods or your favorite God, the only God. And so, you know, after having spent uh, you know, four uh, centuries in, in, in Egypt, the Jews had you know, developed a, a, you know, a, a practice of worshiping many different gods. And so this command is a demand to abandon all other gods and worship and obey only the God who gives these commandments, only the God of Abraham and Isaac and, and Jacob, as far as the, uh, the biblical lineage is concerned uh, for the Jews. Now, why is this a command? 
what's the reason for this commandment? Why would worshiping other gods be harmful, for example? Well, first of all, it would be offensive to the true God. I mean, to recognize something or someone else as the source of life, as the source of the world, is offensive to the one who actually gives life, to the one who actually created the world. It also robs one of the chance to build a relationship with God, with the true God. Okay? And then secondly, it'd be dangerous. When people worship something other than God, they are in effect relying on something that has no power to save them, has no power to help them. I mean, if I believe that this podium here is God and I could, you know, I could get in front of it and worship it and beg it and I could cut myself and bleed, you know, I could offer stuff, I could even take one of my children and sacrifice that, one of my children to, to this podium that I believe is God. Uh, I mean, that's zeal, that's enthusiasm. But the one thing that remains the same is that this podium is not God. And this podium has no power to save me, no power to answer uh, my prayers. So sincere and zealous worship of an idol or an idea of God that is false can never replace the worship of the true God. God, because He is good, sustains and blesses such people for a time on this earth, but eventually they lose the greater blessing of heaven. So if you don't worship the true God on earth, you won't worship Him in heaven uh, either. Uh, now the next question we, you know, we ask in, in all of these uh, lessons is, uh, how do people today break this commandment? Well, for non-Christians, those who do not worship God through His Son, Jesus Christ, break this first commandment. We read about that in Philippians chapter two, verses nine and 10. Here Paul says, for this reason also God highly exalted him, and he's writing about Jesus here. Uh, God exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And so the way to glorify the Father is through the Son. Note that Jesus has been given the name of God. All right? So anyone who doesn't worship Christ as God has broken the first commandment. Now some people honor God, but they don't worship Him, excuse me. Some people honor Jesus, but they don't worship Him as God. Uh, um, uh, Muslims, for example, they honor Jesus. They, they don't disrespect the name of Jesus, but they don't honor Him as God. See the difference there? You can honor something, but uh, not recognize that they are, uh, they are deity, and that's exactly what uh, is taking place there. Um, another, um, so this is how non-Christians break this commandment. They worship something other uh, than God through Christ. How do Christians uh, break this uh, commandment? Well, those who are devoted to or controlled by something or someone else other than Christ break the first commandment in doing so. And you have examples, right? Judas, who was a, a disciple of Jesus, the Bible says in Matthew 27 that he loved money more than he loved the cross of, of Jesus. Uh, another example, uh, the couple Ananias and Sapphira uh, in the book of Acts chapter 15, uh, this couple loved the approval of others and prestige more than they loved uh, service to Christ. Uh, in Colossians 4 and 2 Timothy chapter 4 as well, um, another individual, Demas, who was a disciple of Paul, uh, Demas loved the activity and the pleasures offered by this world more than he loved the body of Christ, uh, of which uh, Jesus is the head. And so each one of these began well as Christians, but uh, like the parable of the seed teaches, things got in the way of following Jesus. Uh, sometimes it's the fear of persecution or the lack of faith that causes one to fall away from Christ, like, like Judas. Sometimes it's our pride that won't allow us to humble ourselves and submit to Christ and His teachings that lead us away from Him, like Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, most of the times it's the allure of the world. It's fun and activity, the pleasures of sin, the never ending demands uh, uh, that it makes on our time that slowly draws us away from making Jesus a priority until He's not even on our to-do list anymore. You know, so busy, no time, no time to pray, no time to learn, no time to read, no time to serve, no time to worship. 
you know, if you're not doing any of those things, you, know, you, you have a hard time calling yourself, you can call yourself a Christian, but you're not a faithful one. And in the end, when Jesus comes, what is he looking for? He's looking for faithful Christians. You know, I tell um, uh, churches, especially small congregations, you know, sometimes they feel self-conscious that they're not very big, we're only 40 people, we're only 80 people, whatever. And I tell them, when, when the Lord comes, He's not looking for the big church or the rich church or the, you know, the, uh, the uh, you know, uh, media savvy church. He's not looking for that. He's looking for the faithful church. So if you're a faithful church of 25 people, yeah. Jesus is looking for you. He's coming for you. You can be a thousand people and you can have all kinds of noise going on, but if you're not faithful to Christ, faithful to His word, then yeah, no point to it. And so, this is the reason we encourage brothers and sisters to make the church and service to the church such a high priority because uh, God has made Jesus the head of the body, which is the church. A lot of our interaction with Christ is exercised and experienced through our relationship uh, with the church. So if we are faithful in serving the body, then we are faithful uh, in serving the head of the body, which is Christ who is God, the only and true God to be worshiped and served. Another question is, how do we avoid breaking this commandment? Well, for non-Christians, it's the belief and obedience to the gospel of Christ that brings them into the first stage of compliance, if you wish. This is why we confess our faith when we're baptized. We're saying that we believe that Jesus is not only God, but that He is the only true God and there are no others. And so our worship of God begins with our faith in Christ. You see, our sincere, effective worship of the true and living God begins with our faith in Jesus Christ. Now for Christians, our compliance to this commandment grows and increases as we submit to the Lordship of Christ in every area of our lives. When Christ grows in His sovereignty over my financial and business decisions, as well as my family matters and work life, my worship life, I am therefore more deeply worshiping the only true and living God. I read from John chapter 12, beginning in verse 44. John writes, And Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me does not believe in me, but in Him who sent me. He who sees me sees the one who sent me. I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father Himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that His commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. So we can know how to make Christ Lord of every aspect of our lives because His word guides us and will judge us as well. And we have to remember that. You know, we always like to say, well, the word of God, you know, it guides us. Yes, it does guide us. It guides us into knowledge and truth, into joy, into happiness, into, into uh, uh, obedience uh, to, 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 to God and Christ, but it also will judge us. We have to remember that. We study it uh, for that purpose as well. Okay, so that's our uh, second lesson as far as the uh, commandments are concerned. Uh, stay with the video and there will be some discussion questions that will come up uh, so that you can have your small group discussion uh, after uh, uh, this uh, lesson is over. I'll see you next time for lesson three in the series. Thanks. Here are the discussion questions. Question number one. When addressing God in prayer or praise, what name, Lord, Father, God, etc., what name do you use most frequently and why? Question number two. What is the greatest difference you see between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament? Question number three. Do Muslims or Hindus, for example, derive any benefit from their worship of their concept of God? And if so, what would it be? Question number four. 
When did you realize that Jesus was actually God? What or who did you think He was before? Question number five. Have you ever fallen away from Christ? And if so, why? And what brought you back? Question number six. What area of your life tends to rebel against Christ's Lordship? How do you bring it into submission? <laughs>